This is the inside story of a £6 billion gamble. The building of the biggest passenger plane the world has ever seen. This aircraft cannot be a failure. We've already spent billions of dollars on this project. And we do have a few billions to spend, yes. <laughs> it's a tale of top secret research and development, of confidential business deals, but above all, of intense personal pressure. These moments really piss me off. This is precision engineering on a mammoth scale. A race against time to construct the largest airliner in history, the Airbus A380. You're looking at what Airbus hope is the future of aviation, about to be assembled for the very first time. Three giant pieces of fuselage will soon become the body of a truly vast flying machine. Over three times as long as a blue whale, five times as heavy. Uh, the A380 marks a new era in airliners a 555-seat, double-decker super-jumbo. Able to fly non-stop a third of the way around the globe. This project is an enormous challenge. Will the parts fit together? Will it be built on time? Just getting this far has taken courage and amazing ingenuity. Over 10 years in the making, the dream is of a new kind of plane built in an extraordinary way. All over the world, massive new factories are building parts for the new machine. It's made using state-of-the-art methods and high-tech materials. But that's just the start. Transporting the giant parts to southwestern France has been an incredible feat in itself. Traveling by river, sea, land and air, components have covered thousands of miles, ducking low bridges, squeezing through tiny French villages in the middle of the night. But the next phase is the toughest yet. The aircraft must be assembled to the tightest of tolerances. The engines, the landing gear, cockpit, the computers must all be tested. With the parts finally gathered together, Airbus is about to find out if their grand vision will work. The stakes couldn't be higher. When you invest $10.7 billion on building what we're pronouncing to be the flagship of the 21st century, you can't fail. There isn't, well, we almost got there, or it's so-so, not too shabby. No, either it's going to be that flagship of the 21st century, or it's going to be a disaster. Here in Toulouse, southwestern France, the company will find out if their huge gamble pays off. In a factory big enough to hold 16 football pitches, they have just 11 months to build the first flying prototype. The clock is ticking. The first task is to join seven major components into one vast aircraft, a process that should take just over five weeks. This is a critical phase. The parts must be assembled perfectly if the plane is to fly as efficiently as Airbus expects. A mistake here would mean the prototype is flawed, which would delay the entire program. We need to be very, very accurate. We have to be sure that the general sh the shape of the aircraft is in line with the specification, and the, that the geometry of the aircraft is good, and to avoid twist fuselage or twist wings. The performance of the aircraft depends on this shape. Gilles Cormier is in charge of the main structural assembly of the A380. Building any airliner requires precision but ensuring that the three enormous body sections 
of this 240-foot-long giant are brought together in a perfectly straight line, presents his team with an exceptional challenge. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. I'm, I'm, I feel very confident now, even if it's difficult, because we have, we have put in place a very accurate systems. The key to success lies in the use of lasers. As invisible beams scan the sections of fuselage, they are reflected by mirrors mounted on the approaching components. From this reflected light, a computer can work out the exact relative positions of the parts, ensuring perfect alignment. Once positioned, the fuselage shells are brought together very, very slowly. Pascal Belloc de Zeus uses a remote control panel to maneuver the sections. Each turn on the dial brings the massive parts a tenth of an inch closer together, moved by huge mobile pillars supporting the shells. On the left, a part made in Germany. On the right, one made in France. This is the last stage of a 1,200-mile journey. Well, the trick, the, the trick is to be organized and then uh, it should go okay. Um, we're in good shape, I think, to start the joining of the uh, fuselage now. The clearance is so tight that metal shoehorns are needed to ease one shell over the other. Speed it up, this is the biggest airliner ever coming together at last. Just as planned, the sections fit together perfectly. The overlap is just six inches wide, and 10,000 rivets will soon hold the French and German built parts together forever. For some, the sleepless nights are over. But even as engineers celebrate an important milestone, the pressure mounts on the sales team. Airbus has to convince the world's airlines that they really do want a plane with 45% more volume than a Boeing 747. The worst that could happen to Airbus, I guess, right now, after having invested the money, getting the airplane ready, is the world's airlines come, they take a look at it, and they say, well, it's not exactly what we had in mind. They've got to come, they've got to look at this airplane, and they've got to be impressed. Selling planes at 146 million pounds a piece is not a stroll in the park. For John Leahy, the pressure is mounting. 250 sales are needed for the project to break even. So far, he's got 139 firm orders. Today, the bosses of Australian airline Qantas are coming to check on their 1.8 billion pound investment. We're going to go out and greet them? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's... Where's Chris? It's that time. It's that time. Are they going to get about a 10-minute warning or something from the bus? It has to go smoothly. But this is one of our best customers, one of our bigger customers now for the 380 program, and we want to make sure that they're happy, that they get the answers from us that they want, and they go away with a good impression. You can imagine what would happen if they came here and said, oh, my heavens. The A380 isn't what we thought it would be. In front of their entire board, that could be devastating. After a presentation, the group will visit a showroom mock-up at the aircraft interior. It's only then that John Leahy will find out if the Australians like what they see. At stake is not only billions of pounds, but the pride and perhaps the future of the company as well. It's going to be a long day. June 2004, and the world's biggest airliner is on schedule, but only just. Two weeks into the structural assembly, 
it's vital to keep momentum going if the plane is to fly on time. Head of the program Charles Champion admits the schedule is tight. It's, it's going fast. It's going fast. It's like a race, it's like a marathon, but like any marathon, it's easy at the beginning and then it starts to be more difficult and I think we are starting to reach that point now. So the question is to manage your energy in order to be able to, to deliver the project. Next, they have to attach the vast British-built wings, but some unscheduled adjustments are needed on the fittings for the joint. As with any prototype, teething troubles are inevitable and project leader Eddie Davis has to respond quickly to these daily challenges. It, it can happen with new aircraft. This is a last minute job that we've had to just come up today. Um, we didn't know that the, the fittings weren't to the, the, the right standard. So now the guys are reworking them. The huge components are 119 feet long and weigh over 40 tons each. Designing them has been an amazingly complex process. To get them this far has already taken over seven years of work. One of the earliest challenges was to minimize something generated by all large aircraft, a potentially lethal, invisible phenomenon called wake turbulence. All planes create spinning pockets of air as they pass. These unseen whirlwinds can cause havoc for planes flying close behind. Wake turbulence is most dangerous in the crowded skies near an airport, and planes are kept at least two minutes apart to reduce the danger. The bigger the plane, the more powerful and deadly the wake can be. The massive A380 could bring airports to a standstill. The challenge was to analyze how the turbulence was generated and to try to minimize the effect. A detailed research program was carried out in this French aerodynamics lab. A precise scale model of the A380 was accelerated along an overhead track and launched into the air. At the far side of the hall is a mountain of finely chopped Kapok foam, designed to give the sophisticated model a soft landing. A curtain of smoke, scanned by a laser, shows the effect of the plane as it passes. This is the normally invisible turbulence. From video recordings, the researchers were able to study how it starts at the wingtip and grows rapidly into tightly constrained regions of spinning air. Full size, these vortices can have the power to flip a following aircraft upside down. After each test, the model was dug out of the foam, cleaned off and prepared for the next run. The data gathered here, combined with results from wind tunnel tests and computer modeling, gave the designers the clues they needed to tackle the problem. Their solution is a wing design featuring these distinctive flared wingtips. As a result, the massive A380 should produce no more turbulence than any other large airliner. None of this will matter though, if the wings are not perfectly positioned when attached to the body of the plane. Time may be tight, but this operation cannot be rushed. This is the point where we'll slowly align the wing with the fuselage and then adjust the angle for the best aerodynamic performance. The efficiency of the plane really depends on us getting this right, certainly, you know, without a doubt. Again, 
The laser positioning system ensures the wing is in the right place and at the right angle. But after a whole day of careful work, a problem appears. Some large bolts have been left attached to the wing. We must uh, remove th this one for, for finish the junction of the, of the wing. A quick phone call to check that it's okay, and they're swiftly removed to allow the build to carry on. A couple of miles away, at the immaculately manicured Airbus headquarters, John Leahy is conducting his guided tour for Qantas. They have arrived at the Airbus showroom, a vast facility full of cabin demonstrators of each type of Airbus plane. Okay, now I think we've got just about everybody. Okay. Though it's all smiles, this is deadly serious. The Qantas top brass will soon get their first sight of a realistic A380 interior. If they don't like it, there'll be trouble ahead. It's almost like a young family introducing their new baby to the relatives. You want everybody to be impressed. You want everybody to say it's beautiful. And deep down inside, you're really waiting to see what they truly do say. Jeff Dixon, head of the Australian airline, is a tough-talking, no-nonsense businessman. Just the type of customer that Airbus must satisfy if the machine is to be a success. But to begin with, he doesn't look too excited. Notice the uh, headroom. This is coming out on standard size. We've got to deliver. We made the promises, and now we have to deliver on those promises. And how do you know if you're really delivering? You look to the airlines, to the customer. He's got to say yes. Here's the premium economy concept. John presses on with the walkabout, and then, almost in a whisper, Jeff reveals his true feelings. Oh, it's fa fabulous. Uh, better than we expected when we ordered, but uh, we did expect a lot, so yeah, right up to expectations. Although the colors and layout will change for Jeff Dixon's planes, this mock-up represents one hard reality. Billions of pounds already spent on an Airbus that has yet to leave the ground. Now, I wouldn't go as far as to say they bet the shop on it, but they've certainly bet a lot on it. Uh, but then, by the same token, we're not betting the shop on buying it, but we're making a huge commitment to an aircraft that hasn't flown. Now, we know and very confident that it will fly, and it will fly very, very well. But still, we're all making um, very, very big commitments and taking quite a few chances in a development like this. There are now just 10 months till the plane is scheduled to fly. It's now mid-June, and as the pressure builds to create the biggest passenger plane ever, there's zero time to waste. This is the horizontal tailplane. With a span of 105 feet, it's as big as the wings of a small airliner. Made of carbon fiber in south and central Spain, it's easily the biggest tailplane ever made. The tail fin is another carbon fiber monster. 46 feet high, this component is made near Hamburg in Germany. When installed, it will stand as high as an eight-story building. Airports will have to buy new cranes to service it. Carefully, it's craned into place and attached with 24 titanium bolts. Charles Champion head of the program comes to check on progress. Gilles Cormier, the guy who runs this station, has bad news for the boss. We've got a problem with this, the tail cone. It's six millimeters out of tolerance, side to side. Uh, it's not good, not good. The last piece of fuselage, the Spanish-built tail cone, is out of line. 
Six millimeters overall? No, from side to side. Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a more serious problem and will take three days to sort out. Time they really don't have. I think it's uh, it's one of it's one of those phases when uh, where the success of the project is at reach, but uh, you have many elements uh, to tackle in parallel in order to make it happen. So uh, you're under control, but uh, you've got to work uh, fast on uh, several parallel subjects uh, in order to be able uh, to deliver the project at the end. The next stage is to install the landing gear. These massive parts have to be unbelievably strong. Not only is the A380 the biggest passenger plane ever built, unfortunately, landing gear in general takes a terrific pounding in the real world. Most landing gear engineers have this low resolution video clip on their computers, a reminder of the extreme conditions that can occur. Heading for the now disused Kai Tak Airport in Hong Kong is a Boeing 747. Approaching in a crosswind, the left-hand gear takes the full weight of this huge plane as it hits the tarmac. That such a difficult landing can be successful, as this one was, is an amazing feat of engineering. That gear was made by the Goodrich Corporation, who are also supplying the main landing gear for the A380. Here, near Toronto in Canada, production is well underway and testing is just about to begin. When we have a new landing gear program, we have a lot of tests that we need to do. Strength, performance, dynamics, um, durability. This one is a performance test. This is one of the first tests we do. It's one of the more important tests. It's called a drop test. What it is, is a simulation of landing. Um, so when aircraft lands, uh, an A380 lands, 560 tons of aircraft moving slowly towards the ground, as well as 200 miles an hour down the runway. When the aircraft hits the ground, something has got to absorb that energy. So if you jump off a chair, you land, your knees have to bend and give a little bit. Even just with the weight of a person, you're going to damage yourself if nothing gives. So that giving of your knees, your legs are absorbing energy. That's what the landing gear has to do, but it has to do it for a set of you know, 180 pounds. It's got to do it for 560 tons. Suspended inside this huge tower, the landing gear is raised in preparation for the drop. The rig is static. So to simulate the approaching ground speed, smaller wheels driven by powerful electric motors spin the big 55-inch tires in the reverse direction. When a switch is flicked in the control room, a hook at the top of the tower will release, allowing the gear to fall. It must absorb the same energy as a 100 mile an hour car crash without being damaged. It's a critical phase in the whole program. This could be a make or break test. If, if the performance of the landing gear isn't what we predicted it to be, it could impact the schedule for the first flight. So it's essential that the gear performs to how we predicted it. And from these tests, we'll be able to tell whether it does. Soon they'll find out if their latest and largest landing gear will make the grade. Although it's huge, this 6.5 ton component is just part of the A380's undercarriage. In total, it will have two six-wheel units plus two four-wheel units under the wings and a two-wheeled set under the nose. So what you're about to see is only a fraction of the energy involved when the vast machine touches down. Okay, I'm going to drop now. Oh, too hot. 
just a delay. You can see it moving here. Oh. All right. The test goes well. Early data shows that although there was an unwanted shudder as the wheels came to a halt, the landing gear shrugged off the huge impact with ease. Back at the factory, there's more good news. With the tail cone and dozens of other problems fixed, the first flying A380 is about to leave the main assembly station. For Gilles Cormier, it's a good moment. Maybe we, we forget a little the, the trouble that we encountered <laughs> during the, the past weeks, and now we, we are looking at the, the aircraft itself, the achievement, more than the difficulties we had. Now's the chance to see at last the biggest airliner ever built. With the shell of the world's largest airliner complete, things are about to get really complicated. It's July 2004, and the plane is scheduled to spend the next few months in this massive hall, where thousands of parts will be fitted, including over 500 miles of wiring. The man in charge of this tricky phase is fully aware there's an awful lot of work to do by the end of October. It's a very difficult challenge, very difficult challenge, because it's a prototype, so it's very difficult to, to, to meet uh, our, our deadline. Coming up is August, the traditional holiday month in France, when most of the country shuts down. For Airbus engineers, there will be no holiday. My family are very uh, aware of this uh, personal challenge, so everybody in the family is OK to say, OK, OK, this year, it's the aircraft here. The plane is lifted on huge jacks and teams of technicians begin work. The plan is for the aircraft to be revealed to the world in a grand ceremony, just 196 days from now. Attending will be heads of state and government, 5,000 guests, and the world's media, with the pictures beamed by satellite all over the world. But just now, this 55-year-old man has a rather special interest in the new machine. Jacques Rosé will be the first person in the world to fly the plane. Seeing it for the first time, his reaction is not exactly what you'd expect. Generally speaking, no, it's, a, it's an aircraft larger than uh, the one we have already, but um, I think I feel very, very confident. He's confident because although the plane is still far from finished, he and his team have already spent thousands of hours flying it. Here in these state-of-the-art simulators lies the heart and soul of the new plane, already living already being tested. Like most modern airliners, the A380 has a fly-by-wire system where the crew, in reality, are controlling a computer which then controls the plane. You don't realize that you fly such a big aircraft. You, you fly it like you fly a, a, a little aircraft. It's, it's incredible. Uh, it's very, very easy to fly, like a bicycle. It's a kind of large bicycle, if you like. Three, two... The technology means one, they can make no. it handle in almost any way they choose. You could make an airplane that when you turn right goes left, or when you turn left goes right, for example. <laughs> you can do anything. Fernando Alonso will also be on the first flight. 
Like all Airbus pilots, his first priority is safety, especially if one of the complex systems were to fail. Designing an airplane to work when everything works is relatively easy. It's, it's building the airplane or designing the airplane to work correctly with failures. It's a little bit more difficult. Yes. I, I, I get Today, they're pushing this system to the limit. They're testing a scenario so perilous that it's only likely to occur once in over a thousand years of flying. Will the plane remain controllable if the wings were covered in ice, two of the engines had failed, and half of the flight computers had gone offline? Now. Sang beta, seven, eight, piece of cake. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. This kind of sophistication comes at a price. The engineering that makes the plane so safe is also extremely complex. And when battling against a deadline, complexity eats valuable time. The schedule is slipping. Work continues at a feverish pace as thousands of components, big and small, are fitted. We can't relax. We can't relax. We have no right, we have no time to relax. So every hour, every minute we are there uh, uh, on the workshop, uh, our main job is to, to receive pressure and to transmit pressure. And it's, it's a nightmare. <laughs> it's a nightmare. <laughs> Five and six could be like, could be one out, about seven. The main problem is that the major parts were not fully finished when they were delivered back in May. The wings, tail and fuselage all need more work. They must be finished before the laborious process of testing the state-of-the-art systems can be achieved. By October 2004, the sophisticated flight deck is nearing completion. This process involves powering up the aircraft's electrical system for the first time. Uh, ah. Hello, Sylvie. Sylvie, hi, that's it. We've got number two. Sebastian, switch the breaker back there, OK? Yep, yep, OK, good. It's uh, very exciting, <laughs> first of all, and quite stressing uh, <laughs> because, uh, because uh, of the challenge that uh, this represents in, in terms of safety, because the tests we are making now, uh, performing now, are the tests of the real aircraft, and we, we have to ensure that the aircraft is, is good. For Ellen Pons, the size and sheer complexity of the task means every day she has a mountain to climb. Every single wire is uh, tested after assembly to verify that uh, all the connections are correctly uh, installed, connected to the right uh, to the right extremities, and that uh, we we can uh, we can perform the function of the of the aircraft uh, without any problem. By now, there are three A380s under construction in the vast equipping hall around half a billion pounds worth of aircraft under one enormous roof. By 2008, when production is running at full speed, a brand new plane will leave this hall every week. This is a big bucks business, and Chief Commercial Officer John Leahy is determined that the project stays on schedule. Getting the airplane out on time is critically important. There are significant penalties that we would have to pay to each customer if we delay his aircraft after a certain grace period of, uh, uh, I don't want to say how long, but a certain grace period involved in every contract. The penalties for late delivery run to hundreds of thousands of pounds a week. And that pressure runs down the chain of command, all the way to the men and women building the machines. Some people could, uh, how do you say, break down? No? Christian Polite is the engineer in charge of the tail fin, known as the vertical tailplane, or VTP. The fitting has not gone smoothly, but finally it's time to install the last piece. It's a camera that gives the pilot a bird's eye view from the very top of the fin, some 75 feet up. 
Right now we are going up to the, uh, almost to the very top of the uh, vertical tailplane uh, in order to install the last component which remains on the VTP still left. Yeah? You can easily see that this part is only screwed to the structure by, I guess, 20 screws around and it has to be connected to the electric system via these two little connectors. The signals are transferred uh, via a fiber optical cable down to a, a monitor in the cockpit. Here at the Airbus factory in Stadt, Germany, back in February 2004, Christian oversaw the final construction of the largest carbon fiber fin ever conceived. The ambitious scale of the production process meant there were always going to be problems. We started with a schedule which allowed us to assemble the first fin uh, within a reasonable time, but in fact we encountered problems which delayed the, uh, the time for the assembly uh, and to worsen the situation the lead time was shortened. So we ended up with a lead time that was nearly half of the original lead time we planned. Although the fin was delivered on time, Christian's work was not finished. The fin was delivered with so many jobs left to do that he had to move to France to continue the work. We came here and thought we had it. We have a good planning, we have a good time schedule, we have everything on hand, and, but it wasn't like that. The moment we started working, uh, we had to, to change each and every, every point. The planning was upside down and so we had to just to start to work. So that's the way you can find the way through the jungle. Yeah. Now though, as the screws go in on the camera, the end is in sight. It's a good sound. That means the screw is in. With every screw we're a little step towards the end, yeah? But then nee. there's a problem. Nee, nee, nee. The fiber optic cable is too short to reach the camera. The connector is here and the cable ends here and we have to have another one centimeter, about one in, about half an inch, which is the cable too short. I mean, but these are, yeah, these moments really piss me off. I mean, when you're almost done, so close, you can see the end. You, you almost stepped over the line and then someone blocks you, hits you in the face, saying, hey, you're not yet done. How could you imagine? Despite the setbacks, in other areas, things are going to plan. Now they can begin mounting the engines, one of the most impressive and expensive single parts of the whole aircraft. Together, four of these giant Rolls-Royce Trent 900s cost nearly 36 million pounds. That's the same as four tons of solid gold, a quarter of the cost of the finished plane. Flight testing began back in May 2004, when the new engine was bolted onto an Airbus A340, a much smaller airliner. It dwarfs the other engines. Weighing over six tons, the Trent 900 can produce up to 35 tons of thrust at full power, burning a gallon of fuel every four seconds. These early tests prove the engine at altitude, but there's a much, much tougher test to come. Here in Hucknall, Nottinghamshire, another test engine will soon be a smoking ruin deliberately destroyed as part of a dramatic and crucial safety test. It's an important milestone for the entire A380 project, 
and as engineer Hilary Barton travels to the test, she admits to some nerves. I'm just going to look a few butterflies at the moment, but basically um, everybody's done the preparation and it's just now a matter of, of getting on and doing the test. But obviously before the, the engine starts, she's sitting there just kind of hoping it all go well, but uh, just really waiting for it to happen now. Every few years, a fan blade will fail in a jet engine somewhere in the world. A rare but violent event that must not put lives in danger. At the root of the colored blade is an explosive charge. With the engine at full power, it will be detonated, releasing the blade with astonishing force. Whatever happens, the blade must not be allowed to burst out of the engine, where, in real life, it could do serious damage to the rest of the aircraft. In a room 200 yards away, watching via a video link, are 25 key personnel, each hoping the test goes as planned. In the split second the blade is released, the engine must successfully contain an enormous amount of energy. It is a very, it is a very violent um, test. This thing is spinning around, it's at full power, so you've got uh, the forces on, on the blade uh, are quite, quite significant. It's like having a, a locomotive uh, hanging on, on, that, on that blade. So you're obviously having to contain the energy of, of that system. So there's a lot of energy involved in the design and containment of the, of the blade. I mean, the whole, you know, the whole engine will get a huge, big shape. As ever, the size of the A380 increases the challenge. The bigger the engine, the bigger the blades, and the greater the energy released if one were to fail. Spinning at 3,000 revolutions per minute, the blades experience a force of more than 7,000 times their own weight. So everything is done to make them as light and as strong as possible. A top secret process molds the plates from ultra strong, ultra light titanium alloy. To save further weight, the blades are heated to 900 degrees in a furnace until they are softened. The gas is pumped into cavities inside the blade, inflating it like a long, thin balloon. The result is a hollow part curved in three directions for aerodynamic efficiency. Supremely strong, yet light enough for someone to pick up and move quite easily. Each one costs the same as a luxury car. And a full set of 24 are about to be destroyed in the name of safety. As the critical test for the Airbus A380's engine gets underway, it's run for five minutes at low power, so final checks can be made. Over in the viewing room, Hilary Barton and her colleagues are anxiously waiting. The main concern is that as the blade is blown free, the casing around the fan absorbs the huge impact and prevents potentially lethal shrapnel from escaping. High-speed film cameras are used to analyze the action, and at last, the throttles are opened and the engine brought to its full, awesome power. This is what it feels like to be inside a building 200 yards away from a nine million pound blade off event. Blade off testing is normally top secret. But for the first time, Rolls-Royce have released this footage. Although the engine was totally destroyed, the fan case did its job, and no large lumps of metal were ejected.
Well, that was an expensive five minutes. <laughs> For Hilary Barton, it's been a good day. I feel very relieved, obviously. It's gone well, we've had a good test and it's all credit to the guys. And yes, we've, we've, got, we've got a successful test under a belt. So I uh, feel relieved and really pleased. Back in France, the plane is about to leave the equipping hall. Instead of the planned October afternoon, it's a foggy, grey December morning. With the grand unveiling just five weeks away, the next giant task is to paint the massive machine. In yet another vast hangar, working over the Christmas holidays, 90 painters descend on the plane. First, they rub down over 100,000 square feet of bodywork. Then, after a superhuman effort of masking off, the A380 is ready for a brand new paint job. All in all, more than half a ton of paint and primer are needed to protect the aluminium skin from the elements. The final livery is a closely guarded secret and won't be revealed until the big day. Until now, the A380 has been a private project. Today, it goes public. As usual, it's a massive undertaking. Inside part of the final assembly line, seating for 5,000 guests has been installed. In the equipping hall, TV reporters are hard at work, feeding the story to the networks. Richard Branson, head of Virgin Atlantic, has grabbed the headlines with news of double beds and casinos in his planes. For John Leahy and thousands of others, it's a dream come true. It took an awful long time to get here, didn't it? But now we're here. It's pretty exciting. The heads of state and governments arrive and take their places for a spectacle featuring dry ice, flying machines, and computer graphics. Speeches are made, but there's only one star of this show. Finally, the biggest airliner of all time is there for all to see. Today is the culmination of more than 10 years of effort by thousands of people from all over the world. I do feel really, really uh, touched by this very moment, yeah. Well, it's a good achievement, huh? I mean, a good show and uh, good speeches and uh, a nice aircraft, and uh, tomorrow back to work to make it fly. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. This is an exciting day, but we can't relax. You can't let up on the pressure. The pressure for sales, the pressure for performance, the pressure to get this airplane out and make it happen. There's still a very long way to go.